Solomon said, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. You're watching the ancient landmark with Jared Jacobs. First century gospel preaching for the 21st century. And welcome to this another edition of the ancient landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs. I'm so thankful to be with you. So thankful for this opportunity that we have to open up God's Word and to study together. I encourage you to get a Bible out, follow along with the things we're going to study. Feel free to take any notes that you'd like to take as well as we study from the book of God. We're going to be looking and studying together in the book of Acts chapter 16 here in just a moment. In the New Testament, the, the fifth book of the New Testament, the book of Acts, in chapter 16. We're going to be looking there and, and, and really just walking down through several verses and learning about an occasion here where the Apostle Paul converted uh, through his preaching, he converted a man of, of Philippi, city of Philippi. He was a jailer and his whole household. We're going to look at that and study that together. And like I said, if you'd like to study, get a Bible out, and follow along with the things we're going to be reading and looking at, uh, feel free to take any notes. We'd love for you to come and visit with us with the Southside Church of Christ. We meet uh, at 2920 New Hartford Road here in Owensboro. And we'd love for you to come be with us uh, come visit with us on, on the Lord's Day uh, at 9.30 uh, for Bible classes, 10.20 for morning worship. Uh, we have an evening worship at 5 on Sunday, and then Wednesday night we meet at 7 and also have Bible study then. And you'd be an honored guest if you come be with us and study together. We'd love to see you. We also have a website that's available to you, uh, www southside-churchofchrist.com that's available to you 24 hours a day of course and it is chock full of Bible studies and, and archived TV programs and uh, written material and sermons you can listen to and just all kinds of things there for your Bible study we encourage you to come visit and, and there's contact information there and you can write to us you can send us emails and what have you and ask your Bible questions and we can study the Bible certainly be a wonderful thing. We'd love for you to come and, and to check out that website and uh, come be with us. Uh, in addition to that, we have a website that's dedicated to these television programs. Uh, and that is on YouTube, and it's youtube.com slash theoldpaths1994. And if you go to, there to YouTube and look us up, there's an entire page just dedicated to these programs. Uh, archive programs of Bible study and the hopes of helping folks uh, get from earth to heaven. So what I'd like for us to do in our study this time is look at Acts chapter 16 and there begin to study and really the section that we're going to be reading uh, begins about verse uh, 16 and goes down to about verse 31 or so. That's the section of scripture but just to set the context Acts chapter 16 tells us how the Apostle Paul and Silas and Luke and others have been traveling and, and they, in chapter 16 they go into a place called Macedonia. Before this time, God didn't want them going in there just right away. He wanted them preaching in other places. But in Acts chapter 16, the Bible says that, that uh, Paul saw a vision and in that vision there was a man from Macedonia saying, Come over, he says, into Macedonia and help us. And he understood that it was his responsibility to go and to preach the gospel to those people. So having arrived in Philippi, the Bible says uh, that as they get there, they meet uh, some ladies there that were by the river, gathered by the river, and were praying to God. That they preached the word to them. And as a result, we find this one lady in particular, her name was Lydia, she hears the word, and she believes she is baptized. Not only she, but all of her household. They hear the truth, they believe it, they obey it. See, they're baptized, the Bible says, for their midst of sins. And as a result then, they, uh, she rather, invites him to stay and stays on at their house. So he continues in the city of Philippi. Having converted not only Lydia, but her household, the Bible says that they were... Uh, continuing in the city of Philippi. Philippi was a Roman colony and uh, certainly the Romans, uh, the, the influence of Roman culture and Roman society was there, there's no question. Uh, and so as he continues, the Bible says this, 
It says in verse 16, as we were going to the place of prayer, he says, we were met by a slave girl who had the spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. And so just set the stage. You see here Paul and Silas, Luke uh, was there. That's the writer of the book of Acts. And so as you notice, he says, as we were going and we were doing this and we were doing that. Luke was there at Philippi. He's included himself in this narrative. And so as he's speaking about this, he says, we were there. About that time of prayer, he says, we met this slave girl. Now, this gal had a demon in her. That's what he's talking about. She had a demon in her, which allowed her to tell fortunes and so forth, that kind of thing. And there were some men who owned her. She was actually a slave. They owned her. And so these men got money because they would take her uh, she would say whatever uh, because that demon was inside of her. Then those who were her customers then, of course getting the fortune telling done, would then pay them. So they like it. They're, they want her to continue on. Well, in the process of this, the demon recognizes who? He recognizes Paul and he recognizes the fact that not only Paul but Silas those with him. He says these, he says, are servants of the Most High God. You know, it's fascinating to me to note that because not only here, but if you go back in, in the book of, of Matthew and other places, when Jesus Christ was on this earth, the demons would come out and they would say uh, very clearly, He is the Son of God. They would confess that yes, He is, Jesus is the Son of God. It is amazing to me to think about the demons confessing Christ. So many times men wouldn't do it. So many times the people that day when Christ was on earth, they wouldn't confess him. And yet the demons would. Think about that. The demons, those who were condemned, those who were the devil's ministers and the devil's angels, and yet whenever they saw Jesus, they couldn't help but tell the truth. They couldn't help but say, this is the Son of God right here. He's in front of us. He's the Son of God. And now, uh, here obviously Jesus has ascended back to God, Acts chapter 1. But when the demons see the servants of Jesus, when they see the servants of the Most High God, they can't help but confess that's who they are. They can't help but tell the truth. And that's what this demon was doing through the girl. Well, after so many days of this, it says Paul was greatly annoyed, annoyed at this and he uh, cast out the demon. You say, well, why would he do that? Well, think about this. Would you want to be associated with a demon? Would you want to be associated with a demon-possessed person if you lived in that time period? And here you are trying to preach the truth and you're trying to tell people what is right and tell people about the Lord and, and convict them and convert them to God. And all the time you got this little fortune teller girl running up going, yeah, they're right, they're right, yeah, they're the ones. Yeah, you don't want that, do you? You don't want to be associated with this demon-possessed girl. I mean, the demon is evil. The demon is wicked. And so you certainly don't want to be associated with the fortune tellers and the charlatans and those who are just out to get money. And so he cast the demon out. Well, good for the girl, bad for them. And I say that from the standpoint of physically. Watch what happens. In the book of Acts chapter 16, when the owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, when they realized it was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. In other words, before the authorities. They're dragging them out before them, before the authorities who, who would be able to do something about these men. Of course, why, why, did, why were they so upset? Were they bothered by this? Were they upset at the preaching as such? Were they mad because they thought Paul and Silas told false doctrine? No. Look at what he says. When they realized their hope of gain was gone, that was the problem. When they realized he just cast out the demon and that means that girl is no good to us anymore. We can't use her for money making uh, projects and all that. We can't use her to give us money. We can't do it. Then they got upset. 
These men were not concerned about her welfare. These men were not concerned about, hey, we've got this girl and she's possessed. They weren't concerned about that. They didn't care. When they realized all hope of gain was gone, then they got upset. Folks, it's the same way today. There are people today who will use you. There are people who will uh, take advantage of you. They will, they will do that in the hopes of gaining something from you. You know that? They will do it. It goes on. It happens every day. You can look back even in your Bibles in the book of Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15, when the prodigal son, you remember, takes his father's money, he goes into a far country, and they're wasted. He had, as it were, he had friends, he had all this, but he wasted. And then the Bible says he had, and all his money was gone, and no man gave to him. Nobody would give to him. Nobody uh, cared for him. Nobody was concerned about him. And so he goes, and as we would say today, he hits rock bottom. And he hits rock bottom because there he is, a Jew, working for a Gentile, staying in the, in the swine with the pigs, all right, which they were unclean to the Jews. And so he wasn't even supposed to be around them. And there he was in, in the sty with them and then eating the stuff that the pigs wouldn't eat. You ever raise pigs? You ever been around pigs? You ever seen anything a hog wouldn't eat? And yet he had to eat the things that they wouldn't eat. Now, what happened? The same thing in Luke 15 as it going in Acts 16. When the reason for caring is gone, those who are supposed to be your friends, they'll be gone too. Do you know that? That this is just, a, just an illustration, if you will, uh, we, we see here these, these people existed. That's not my point. These people existed. They're real people. But their actions illustrate what the world at large is like. If the world cannot use you, if the world cannot take advantage of you, if the world cannot use you for some kind of gain to receive, then people of the world don't care about you. Now the Lord cares about you. God loves you. He loves you so much He sent His only begotten Son to die. John 3.16 he loves you so much that He made this world and He made you in the first place. Revelation 4 tells us that in verse 11. He loves us. He wants you. He cares about you. And you didn't have to do anything to make Him love you. You didn't have to prove yourself. He loves you already. That's the difference between God and the world. Now here we see how the world acts. When the reason for their caring was gone. When all hope of gain from her was lost, now we're mad. They didn't care whenever she could provide for them. They didn't care about her. But now that, that demon's gone, now we're upset. Now it bothers us. And that just shows the convoluted thinking that is in this world today. That shows the convoluted thinking that is so much a part of our society. And it's tragic, it's terrible that we wouldn't be like that, uh, that we would be like that rather than being as the Lord wants us. Jesus said in the book of Matthew chapter 22 and verse 39 that, that the second commandment was to love thy neighbor as thyself. And he tells us not only this, but in the book of James, we read it, James chapter 2, that it is the royal law. In fact, it's what he calls it, the royal law. Love thy neighbor as thyself. For we do it now. Do we truly love our neighbor as ourselves? These men weren't. These men weren't acting that way at all. Or they would have cared about that girl. They would have been concerned. They would have gone to Paul and to Silas and some of those others uh, that were with them at that time. They would have gone to Paul the apostle and said, Listen, we've got this gal here and she's got a demon. Please cast it out of her. They would have been asking for that. Just like folks did in the, when Christ was on earth and the people would come to him and they would say so and so has a demon would you please cast it out of him and Jesus would cast the demons out those people and I agree not everyone was like that but there were people in Christ's day that were like that because they loved their brother, sister they loved whoever it was and they wanted that demon out of them same thing here in Acts 16 except the fact these folks did not love that girl and they wanted that demon to stay. When all the hope of gain was gone, 
They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace, it says, and brought them to the rulers. That's verse 19, verse 20. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. Now stop right there. That's down to verse 21. Stop that for a moment. You think about this. Paul and Silas have been around for some time. Go back in, in the book of Acts chapter 16. And there it says they had been there for, for many days. They had been there proclaiming the truth. If these men had a problem with the doctrine, they should have said something a long time before now. You know, they should have said that way earlier than this. No, my friends, they didn't care. That wasn't the reason for saying this. What they're trying to do is stir up a stink. And because they can't do it by saying, you know, they cast out the demon in that girl, and so we're upset now because we lost our money. Why, if, if, if someone like that today were to try that, and to say somehow, and, and again, not about demon possession, but just to say, you know, we had, some, we had a good racket going, and now we can't take advantage of whoever it is, and we had a good racket going where we didn't have to work and they did it all and we got the money. You know, if something like that was said, we would and try to go to the police or try to go to the city officials about that and say how they've been unjustly treated. Why, people would say, you're crazy. Go out and get a job. What's wrong with you? Why were you hurting them? Why were you taking advantage of that person? Get a job and be an honest person for a change. Well, that's what would have happened here too. So instead of saying, you know, we've been taking advantage of this girl and, and Paul comes along and he makes it so we can't do that anymore and so we're upset and we're mad about that and so arrest him. They would have said the same thing. They'd say, get a job. What's wrong with you? So what we had to do was they had to lie. These men are Jews and they are teaching things. They're advocating customs that's not lawful for us as Romans. Uh, we, can't, we can't do what they're saying. In other words, they're, they're teaching stuff that's illegal. They're telling us to do things that's, that would be illegal and would be against the law to do. Now, was that right? Of course not. They were lying about it. I mean, these men, of course, have been preaching all, all around. Uh, they've been in Philippi, like we already noticed, and they have been there uh, in, in Philippi for many days. They've been there for a good while, and they've obviously attracted folks to them to listen. They've converted the whole household of Lydia, and no doubt they have continued in, in speaking and telling folks and, and, and getting an interest in the truth. See that? It's the difference between true and false. And what's sad is whenever people cannot... Whenever people realize they are confronted with sin and they realize that they are in a corner, you might say, they'll do anything they can to get out of it, including lie. They'll do anything to make sure they're not the ones that look bad. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever lied about something or somebody because really you realize the guilt of your own sin, but instead of just admitting to it, instead of just being honest and saying, you know, I did. Instead of doing that, you turn around and say, well, what about them? What about what they did? What about, what about how they act? Could that be you? Could that be me? Could I be guilty of the very same thing? They said, they're, they're teaching us to do illegal things. It wasn't illegal. It wasn't illegal to, to be baptized. It wasn't illegal to believe on Christ. It wasn't believe, illegal to believe on, on, on Jehovah, the God of heaven. It wasn't illegal to do that. That wasn't it at all. They had to figure out something to stir this town up. And so the crowd joined in and attacked them. The crowd joined in. Mob mentality. See? You get a mob, you can get a mob going pretty easy if you just spread the right lie at the right time to the right person. It'll just spread like wildfire. And you can get a mob going. That's what they did. The crowd's all upset. The crowd's all tore up over this. This is verse 22. And they attacked him. And the magistrates tore the garments off of him and gave orders to beat them with rods. To beat them with rods. And when they inflicted many blows on them, 
They threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And that's down to verse 23. When they beat on them, and they beat on them with rods, and they inflicted many, it says many blows, not a few, many. Can you imagine being beaten and with rods over and over and over and over and over again for no reason at all, no justified reason at all, but only that you told the truth and in fact had helped a girl cast the demon out that couldn't do anything but help her. Can you imagine that? That's the kind of thing these men suffered for the cause of Christ. And we read about this not only here, but also in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he talks about the uh, problems he endured. He talked about the, the things that he suffered. Apostle Paul suffered, he said, as a Christian. And the things that he had gone through there in those days. And how that of the Jews, five times, he said, received I forty stripes save one. In other words, five times I received 39 stripes. He said thrice was I beaten with rods. That's verse 25. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-five. 25. Thrice, three times was I beaten with rods. No doubt Acts 16 is one of those occasions. He's beaten with rods. They take rods, and just as was described here, they're taking a rod and taking it and beating it on their bare backs and beating and whipping and whipping and, and smacking them with this rod literally till the skin breaks, till they're bleeding, till uh, just extreme, extreme pain. Now, like we noticed here in 2 Corinthians 11, what we noticed here was that of the Jews, five times received by 40 stripes save one. They had, in other words, 39 stripes. I got 39 from them. See, and the point was in the Jews' custom, there was a law. They made a law that said you can't beat somebody any more than 39 times. In other words, you could beat them less than that, but 39 was the maximum. So what generally happened was you'd take somebody and they'd beat them. They'd beat 13 times down, down the left side of your back, 13 times down the right side of your back, and 13 times down the middle. See, and that's 39. And that's the way they would do it. And then they quit there, making sure not to get over 40. And uh, as if one more would hurt less or hurt more, whatever. But at 39, the Romans didn't follow such a rule. The Romans would just beat and beat and beat and beat and beat on you until they got tired. And once they were through, uh, with, in the case of, of the Romans, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers would take and they would whip on you and they'd beat on you until the guy got tired. And then he'd hand it to another guy who was fresh and then he'd beat on you for a while until he got tired. And they might hand it back to the first guy because he got rested up or someone else might take over and they'd just beat and beat and beat and beat on you till they had enough. That's what he's endured. Here, they, they beaten with rods. Acts 16, this is it. They took Paul and Silas and they beat on their bare backs until they got tired of it. The pain... You can't imagine the pain. I can't imagine the pain, the excruciating pain. And then telling them to tell the jailer, throw him in the jail and keep him there. Do this, does this crowd know why? No, they're taking the word of one man who lied. No, no court, no justice, no nothing. And continue on. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. And that's down to verse 24. Having heard this, he takes them, he says, and he puts their feet in the stocks, fastens them, puts them in the inner prison. In our, in our terminology, that's kind of like saying they put him under the jail. Okay? The inner prison, that was down below the regular prison. That's where you keep all the, you know, all the really bad people. Though, you know, there's no light. There's no anything. You're under you're in the inner prison here. You're in the inner most part of it, see? And so, there's no way you're escaping. There's no way you're getting out. That's where we keep the dangerous people. And we put Paul and Silas, preachers of the gospel, preachers of the truth, and took them and put them in the inner prison. And fastened their feet in the stocks, 
In other words, um, restraints there upon their legs and ankles there that actually were they were solid. They would you would clamp you know both legs, and in between them would be a, a rod, a solid piece. And so what that did was that immobilized you. Now if you laid, I mean you could lay down and your feet would be kind of spread out like this. Your feet would be out or whatever. And you could lay down and you might be able to sit up if you tried hard enough. But you can't roll over. I mean your feet are stuck. They're out here. You can't roll. You can't, there's not a lot of movement you can do. You know you're not going to jump up real quick and run away because you're, you're fastening these things. And there they were, stuck. Bro broken, bleeding, pain, anguish, sitting in a prison for no more than serving the Lord and doing what the Lord said. And now they're sitting in a prison. Now what happens to these people? What happened to them? What goes on in this prison when things seem so hopeless? We're coming up on a break. But after the break, we'll come right back to Acts chapter 16. We're starting verse number 25. And we'll continue in that study. And we'll find out what happens and what goes on here and make some more applications to our daily life. So you stay tuned and we'll be right back. You're watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs. Write to us at 2920 New Hartford Road, Owensboro, Kentucky, 42303. Visit us at Southside Church of Christ. Our website is www.southside-churchofchrist.com We have Sunday morning Bible classes for all ages at 9.30 a.m. Sunday morning worship service at 10.20 a.m. and Sunday afternoon worship at 5 p.m. Our Wednesday night Bible classes for all ages begin at 7 p.m. Write to us for a free correspondence course or a subscription to our teaching bulletin, The Old Paths. We invite you to tune into our radio program, What is Written, from 12.30 to 1 p.m. Sunday on WBIO 94.7. The Ancient Landmark airs daily, beginning Monday at 9 p.m., Tuesday at 1.30 p.m., Wednesday at 5 p.m., Thursday at 11 p.m. and Friday morning at 9.30. Again, our address is The Ancient Landmark, 2920 New Hartford Road, Owensboro, Kentucky, 42303. We've been asked a very interesting question. I think it's a very interesting one anyway. Uh, we've been asked the question, do, uh, do biblical artifacts have any significance today? Now I thought that quite fascinating. I suppose people think about such things as the, you know, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, Indiana Jones went after in the movie. And, and we think about the Ark. Some people talk about uh, finding Noah's Ark. You know, even today, and folks have said they had pieces of the ark, or pieces of the cross, and that type of thing, which of course has been proven to be false. Uh, but someone said, "Well, what about biblical artifacts? What about things we could find that might, you know, be old, be from Bible days? Do they have any significance at all?" I suppose if you could find something like that, I'm not saying they don't exist, but I'm saying if you could find things like that, if you could hold on to them, if you could touch them or keep them at your house, uh, what purpose would they serve? You know, it's fascinating whenever I open the Bible and begin to read and study, I find that whenever God uh, was using something, it was, it was useful for that time, but whenever He was done, He got rid of it. Uh, the God of heaven is no pack rat. And for example, we think about the ark that Noah and his family and all the animals and so forth, and they, they was used, it was useful for a time. 
And it said he landed there within the mountains of Ararat. But after that time, we don't read anything else about it, do we? When it came to the Ark of the Covenant, and uh, there what was used uh, and during those days of wandering, during those days before Solomon built the temple, the tabernacle, of course, was used. Then the ark and so forth was brought into the temple after the destruction of the temple. And those, the furniture, the gold, and all of that's taken away by Babylon. After that, we really don't read about the ark anymore, do we? After that, we really don't read about those things as such. What happened to them? Where, where are they? See, I don't know. What's happened to those things? We find significance placed on biblical artifacts, not from God placing significance on them, but rather from man. I'll give you an example of this. In Numbers chapter 21, the Bible says that, that whenever the people were bit by the serpents, Numbers chapter 21, after they're murmuring, people were bit by the serpents and they were dying. So God made a command and He said, I want you to take a, a piece of brass and make a brass serpent. Put it up on a pole. And then the people can look and see the brass serpent on the pole and they will live. And that's what, exactly what happened. Numbers chapter 21. From verse 1 down about verse 9. And through there you can, you can read about this. And then after num the book of Numbers 21, we really don't read about it anymore. And we might think, well, it just kind of faded into obscurity. 2 Kings chapter 18 uh, tells us about it. 2 Kings chapter 18 describes for us, this is several hundred years later. Several hundred years later and now here is Hezekiah reigning over Judah. And the Bible says in verse 4 that among other things what he did was that he cut, he says he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. What? See that bronze serpent that Moses had made, evidently they carried that with them all around all through these years. And now it's that Bible says they had, he took it and he uh, broke it in pieces it says, for until this day the people of Israel had made offerings to it. And he called it Nehushtan. Now the word, word Nehushtan means nothing. It's a piece of brass. And he tells them, this is just a piece of brass. You need to get rid of this. And so they did finally in the days of Hezekiah. There is no significance to these biblical artifacts really. And someone may say, well I know where the Holy Grail is. Well you might know where it is and what happened to it and so forth. And that's fine. But really the only significance was during the time it was being used. It has no significance today. Why not? Well, among other things, God doesn't want any idols. And what would a man or a woman do had they possessed, right now, the Ark of the Covenant or the, the breastplate that Aaron had with the Urim and the Thummim and the, and the stones and so forth. What would they do with that? Would they not turn that into an idol? Or if you could really find the Noah's Ark, or if you could really know about the actual piece of wood that Christ was crucified on, would people not turn that into an idol? Absolutely. God said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We're not to worship anything but Him. And for that reason, if nothing else, for that reason, you're not going to find those types of artifacts. Number two, they have no significance for us today because once used, then they were put away and they had served their purpose and they're gone. Our focus needs to be on God and needs to be on serving and worshiping Him the way He directs. And we're back again. We want to continue in our study of the book of God. We were uh, studying from Acts chapter 16. And we left off at verse 25. Noting that at this point, uh, Paul and Silas have been beaten. And they are in stocks. Their feet or the legs are fastened in the stocks. And uh, they're, they're in the inner prison. The Bible says in verse 25. They're in there, of course, because, uh, because the men lied about them and said they were teaching things that were illegal, which wasn't the case. Well, verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to the Lord, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loose. 
Now stop right there. That's verse down to verse uh, 27. Now notice, please, what's happened. They're in a prison, aren't they? And the Bible says at midnight, I don't know when they got in the prison, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing praises to God. And the prisoners heard them. The prisoners were listening to them. Those within that inner prison and around, they're listening. They're to Paul and Silas. I want you to think about something. Well, something that, that has struck me as I think about this occasion, I think about what's going on. Remember, these people have been beaten. Paul and Silas are beaten. And again, their, their backs are bloody. Perhaps they're even sitting or, or laying down, as, as the case may be, with their feet in those stops. Perhaps it is that they might be in the pool of their own blood. Perhaps it is they're, they're trying to, and they're so raw, their flesh and everything is so raw that even the air hurts. And here they are. And what were they doing? Were they crying out, oh, woe is me? Were they crying out, why us? Were they crying out, I hate God? Were they crying out, uh, we're innocent? Were they crying out any of those things? That might be uh, something that you and I might have said. I might be saying those things. What were they doing? He says they were praying and singing praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. I wonder uh, here, whenever they were praying, what kind of a prayer do you pray in prison? What kind of a prayer do you pray then? Do you pray a prayer that says, Lord, we thank Thee for the beauty of our surroundings? Is that what you do? Do we say... Uh, we're thankful for all that, all that you've given to us. See that? Oh, thank you, oh Lord, for what I have received. What do you pray then? They were praying prayers to God. And whenever you consider the fact that these were men who were doing this whenever it hurt to breathe, let alone speak and to speak out to God, they were praying to God. Might you have said, uh, something like uh, Acts chapter 5. Perhaps they were praying a prayer uh, such as uh, the word stated in Acts chapter 5 when it says that after uh, Peter and John and after those folks had been beaten then, Acts chapter 5, it says that they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Acts chapter 5 there in verse 41. They rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. Might they have prayed a prayer that said, Thank you, Lord, that we're accounted worthy to suffer shame for Your name? Might they have prayed a prayer that said, Lord, we recognize what You went through and what You suffered uh, there before the cross and suffered on the cross. Therefore, our suffering pales in comparison. Might they have said some things like, you find over in the book of Corinthians, where he says, where the Apostle Paul's writing to the Corinthians and tells them that the things uh, there that they were suffering, he said, it was our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Might they have said something like that? That what we're suffering, we realize that it is a light affliction. It is, we realize this is but for a moment. And that we are enduring this, but there is something far better that is to come. And Lord, we recognize that. We thank you. We're counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. No, I recognize we don't have their prayer. We don't have that written out for us verbatim. I recognize that. But might they have said those things? That at least seems plausible because I read about those words being spoken at other times in the Bible. Again, you think about they sang praises unto God. What kind of songs? Do you sing in a prison? What kind of songs do you sing then? See that? Think about that. And another thing, when you think about these songs they're singing, recognize the fact, and, and it'll, be, it'll be evident here in a moment, recognize the fact though they're in the dark. It's pitch black in there. Number two, they don't have songbooks with them. Remember that. They don't have songbooks in there. They don't have a light to read by even if they did have a songbook. So whatever songs they're singing must come forth from themselves. It must be something that pours forth. The Bible tells us that from the abundance of the heart, 
The mouth speaketh. You know that? We know that, don't we? We recognize the fact that it is what comes forth from the, from the heart comes out of the mouth. And these folks in this position, in this situation of being beaten and mistreated and harmfully used and they're wrongfully in prison and in prison for a crime they didn't commit uh, quite literally and there they are suffering at this time and yet they recognize and they understand that they could praise God and they could sing to God and they, they could do so because they knew God wasn't at fault but it was those men who were at fault yea it was the devil who was at fault See, Satan was, is behind the whole thing. Make no mistake about it. You don't have to have the word Satan on this page to recognize Satan was behind it because Satan is an enemy of God and Satan will do and has done and continues to do everything he can to stop God's word and God's uh, will and God's plans from coming to fruition. He has been doing so from Genesis chapter 3 on forward. He tempted Adam and Eve and was successful in tempting them. He, he went through and he tempted Cain and was successful with him. Don't think that Satan wasn't there whenever Cain offered a sacrifice that wasn't pleasing to God. Hello, he was there. And you go on down the list whenever people, anytime people were guilty of sin and wrongdoing, Satan was around, his temptations were there, he was, his temptations were quite evident all the way through. When those uh, Israelites, uh, they refused to go into Canaan the first time. Numbers 13 and Numbers 14. And whenever the evil report came back that said, we can't go. Make no mistake, Satan was behind that. And so you come in all the way to Acts chapter 16. And you've passed through so many events in history. Even to the temptations of Christ, Satan was there. Matthew 4, Luke 4 says Satan was there. He was tempting Christ. And we see him again behind every one of these things. Go to Acts chapter 16, and when we find Paul and Silas in prison for a crime they didn't commit, and they're suffering, and hurting, and bleeding, and certainly in a, in a case where uh, other men certainly would have been uh, uh, discouraged and want to give up and quit, but it is these men who pray and they sing praises to God because we recognize God's not the one that did this. God's not the one responsible for this, but Satan is. Do we have enough about us that we recognize that it is Satan who's behind our problems and not God? Are you someone right now even who's blamed God? How many times do you hear people blame God for, for bad things that happen? How many times have we heard the statement say, well, if God's real, then why do bad things happen? If God loves you, why did He allow so-and-so to go on? And, and we've heard those things, haven't we? If God's a loving God and if God's so good, then why is there evil in the world? There's evil in the world because men have been tempted to sin and they committed sin. It's because men are at fault, not because God's at fault. It's because men did those things, not because God did it. See that? God, uh, God was not responsible for that. God, James chapter 1, verse 13, God does not tempt men with evil. He doesn't do it. You can't tempt God with evil, and He does not tempt men with evil. Because that's the case, you know He didn't tempt man here. This is Satan's doing. And so you can praise God and thank God. Yes, their lives were spared on that occasion. Not only was it the fact that their lives were spared, but also it's the fact that when we remember that that not only their, their lives physically, but also the fact they have spiritual life, that they have redemption, that they have forgiveness. Even sitting in a prison, they have forgiveness. They are the recipients of God's love. How could you do anything but thank and praise God for that? Well, the prisoners were listening too. And evidently, we're going to see evidently there was another man listening too. As the earthquake happened, and all the doors were open. And the bands were loose, all right? All the, the feet were in the stocks and all that. All those were loose. The doors swing wide open. Everyone has a possibility of escaping. 
But the Bible says when the jailer woke up and he goes on and says uh, he saw that the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and he's about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. You see, back then, whenever, uh, you know, anyone that, that would escape, we held the jailer responsible for that, see. We hold him responsible for the wrongdoing. So he's ready to kill himself because he recognizes, oh, no, they've all left. He thinks this. Oh, no, they've all left, and if they're all left, they left. It's my head. I don't want to endure what I've seen other people endure, so I'll just kill myself. And yet Paul cried with a loud voice, and he said, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Verse 29. The jailer called for lights and rushed in. And he says, And he fell down, and, and trembling in fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And that's why I said a moment ago, they sang those songs in the dark. They sang them in the dark. They didn't know. Uh, in other words, they didn't have a songbook to, to read and to follow. They had to sing it from memory. They had to sing it because it was on their hearts. And I know it because of this verse. He called for a light to go in. And he went in. And notice where he went. He didn't stop at the first door he came to. Did you notice that? He didn't stop the first door he came to. He didn't stop where uh, you know he thought there might be a, a bunch of people gathered. He went over where Paul and Silas were, and he talked to them. He went to Paul and Silas. What did he say to Paul and Silas? He asked them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? See that? Now, why didn't he go to some of those other prisoners and some of those other cells there in the inner prison? Why didn't he go talk to them? See? He went to them. He went to them because he knew who had the answer. See that? Paul and Silas were singing and they were praying to God and the prisoners heard them and evidently we've got somebody else who's been paying attention to. He goes to them. He goes to those people. Paul and Silas who'd been beaten with rods and who'd been so shamefully entreated by the people and thrown in that inner prison. And yet when he goes, he goes to them. He goes to them. What must I do to be saved? Now I want to tell you something. That's, that is so key. That we understand that if I want to know what to do to be saved, I go to the right one. I go to the right source. You know, there's a lot of people today, they might ask mom and dad what to do to be saved. Or they might ask brother and sister. They might just, uh, you know, read a magazine. Or they might think within. And they might say, well, you know, I've just been pondering this and I think that if I do X, Y, Z, then I can be forgiven of sins. Or they might just listen to some preacher somewhere and think that's the way to go. Do you realize none of those are the correct source? None of those people uh, and none of, none of those options bring about salvation. The right source is Christ. And His Word tells us what to do. Romans 1 and verse 16 there the Apostle Paul, the one who's in prison right here, writes a letter in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. See, there were other Jews and Greeks, the Jews and Gentiles, that's everybody. So he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It, that gospel, that has the power of salvation. I'm not going to be saved from my sins if I listen to men, or if I listen to just my own personal thoughts and whims about something. I'm not going to be saved if I just dream it, or if I just make something up, or just say, well, whatever the traditions are that I grew up with, the traditions will be okay. You can't go by that. I've got to go by the gospel. I've got to, tell, I've got to learn what the Lord has said. What has the Lord spoken? What has the Lord revealed? What has he said? That's what I need to go by. That's what I need to learn. And so whenever I open up, whenever I today open up the scripture, I can read what the Lord has said. And I can follow what the Lord has spoken. And without, you know, kind of like the kind of like my old friend used to say, he said to some people you need to have help to misunderstand. <laughs> In other words, if you just open up the Bible and read it, you would understand it. And unfortunately, there's people that, that get help and misunderstand it. Don't do that. Just open the Bible and read it. Read Mark 16, verse 16. Read Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. 
read this scripture. We're talking about this right now. You can read along right with me. Have you noticed that, that in all this time I'm just showing you what the Bible says? We're just reading the Bible, aren't we? That's all we're doing. We're just reading what the Bible says. We're not uh, looking to a creed book or to a manual. I have not referred you to church tradition. I have not referred you to some uh, precedent, some precedent in the law or precedent among church history. Did you notice I haven't referred you to any of those things? I haven't referred you to what some man says, some smart person. I'm not doing that. I'm giving you the smartest, the wisest, when I give you the Word of God. And here he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's the greatest question you could ask. What must I do to be saved? What that tells you is, when he says, what must I do to be saved? Number one, if he says, uh, uh, what must, must, must is the strongest word in the English language. We realize there's no way around this. There's no exceptions to it. I must do it. It's a command. But what must I do? He recognizes he's the one at fault. Did you notice that this jailer didn't come in here and say, Whoa, my, this earthquake and all this stuff. What do these people here need to be need to do to be saved anyway? What do these people, you know, these, these prisoners in here, they're a pretty rotten bunch here. What do they need to do? No, what must I do? To say do means he understands it takes action. It's more than a mental assent. It's more than a wish. It's not just a wish or a thought or whatever. He has to take action. What must I do to be saved? And to speak about being saved tells me that he's admitting I'm not saved right now. I'm a lost person. I want to know something. Have you asked that question? Have you asked that question? And if you have asked that question, did you get the same answers this man's going to get? That's the next thing. Did you get the answer that the Bible gives? Or did you get an answer that a man gives? Because if you ask the question, what must I do to be saved? And you didn't get a Bible answer. Then what you obeyed was not the Bible. You obeyed a man. Hence, you're still lost. Somebody says, that's awful rough. That's awful mean to say. No, that's a loving thing to say. I love you enough to tell you the truth. I love you enough to not let you just live and die in your sin. I love you enough to tell you that the Lord has the answer. And if you relied on a man for the answer, then you've gone the wrong way. And it's the same way with me. If I rely on a man for an answer, I go the wrong way. I've got to listen to what the Lord says. So he asked, what must I do to be saved? They said this. Keep reading. Acts chapter 16. And now, we're at verse 31. They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house, you and your household. You'll be saved. Now, what does that mean? See, now here's where, here's where rub comes in. Because there's a lot of people in this world, and a lot of people in this country, and a lot of people in this state, that would tell you, well, what must uh, you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved in your house, and they act like the rest of that chapter doesn't exist. As if this is the end of the chapter, this is the end of the thought, this is the end of the thing. And so they just say, well, you need to believe. And so if you believe, everything's okay. Just believe. Is that what this passage says? Now you do need to believe, the Bible says in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, that without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And so I must believe. There's no question about that. But does the Bible say faith only? Does the Bible say that you're saved by anything alone? The answer is no. And again, as you continue to read, they said you need to believe on Jesus Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus, You'll be, you should be saved in your household. Verse 32, And they spoke the word of the Lord to him. See, Romans 10, 17 declares, that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. See, I, they can tell him you need to believe on Christ, but if he doesn't know who Christ is, how's he going to believe on him? And this man, being a Gentile and being a Roman, uh, you know, and a jailer and so forth, that doesn't mean he's been exposed to Jesus Christ at all. That's why they're there. That's why Paul and Silas and, and Luke and, and Timothy and all of them have come to Philippi and, and all the other cities, but come to Philippi so as to tell folks about Christ. 
and to tell them the truth. And so here you have access, they do have access to this Philippian jailer and says you need to believe on Jesus. You need to believe Him and, and believe who He is. And you need to believe what He did for you. See, that's coming up. John chapter 3 talks about it as well. And so you've got to have that kind of faith. Well, is it just the historical fact that I believe Jesus is a historical figure? Or is it believe His doctrine? See, let's believe His doctrine. You've got to believe what He said, what He's taught. And that's why they say they spoke to Him the word of the Lord. They taught Him. They spoke to the word of the Lord to Him and all who were in His house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. He washed the wounds. He washed the stripes. Remember they got beaten with rods? Remember that? And he, what he's trying to do here is wash. He's trying to soothe the, the wound. He's trying to make it feel better. He was then baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up to his house and set food before them and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Isn't that something? There's that believe in God again. Whenever they said, see whenever the apostle Paul and here says believe in Jesus Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus, obviously he meant something entirely different than what the world at large means by that. Because the world at large today wants to tell you believe means just a mental assent. You just say, I believe in Jesus and everything's cool. Well, you read this passage. What did he say? Yes, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus. And when he did and he taught and spoke the word of the Lord to him, yes, that produced faith, but he washed their wounds. That's his repentance. See, he's responsible for those wounds. There's your repentance. And then he went and he was baptized. He and all his household. So he heard the word, he believed it, he repented, see, he was baptized, and having been baptized, he rejoiced, he and all his household rejoiced, believing in God. Isn't that something? Believing in God is far more than just the mental assent that says, I believe in something. When the Bible talks about belief, the Bible joins it together with obedience. And you know, really, that is what true faith has to do with because if you truly believe, you're going to do it. If you truly believe, you're going to follow whatever the Lord says. And that's the way it is right here. If you truly believe what the Lord says, you're going to repent of your sins and you're going to confess Him. In fact, in that book of Acts chapter 8, you read about confession. And in the book of Romans 10 and verse 10 and so forth, you're going to be baptized. You're going to be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's what's going to happen. That's what you're going to do. That's how you're going to live. You're going to do that. Why? Because some man said it? No, because Christ said it. You're not going to do it because it's your tradition. You're not going to do it because, well, we like to do it that way. You're going to do it because the Lord said to do it. And they, he was baptized, he and all his household. Now, another thing is this shows us that sometimes God puts us in situations, maybe at first we don't realize why we're there, but at the end of it we realize it was a good thing. They were in prison. That wasn't good. They were beaten. They were miserable. That wasn't the way to go. But you see how the end of it, God worked it out for their good so that the best came from it and a whole household was saved because of it. You think about this. God puts you in front of this television program right now. And you're watching it, and I'm glad you're watching it. Now, I don't know why you've endured to this point, but you have, and I'm glad you've listened, and I'm glad you've been here to listen to it. Maybe it is that you need to be saved. Maybe it is you need to be right in the sight of God. Why don't you do what the Lord says? Why don't you do what the Philippian jailer did? Repent of your sins and be baptized for the remission of your sins so that you can rejoice. You and all your household can rejoice because you believe in God and you did what the Lord said and you're preparing your soul for heaven. If I can help you in any way, I want to do it. Why don't you contact me? Let's talk about this. Let's do what the Lord says to do and live the way the Lord says to live. Follow just what the Bible says. We're so thankful for this time and thankful for our study. Until next time, Lord willing, we bid you good day. You have been watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs, first century gospel preaching for the 21st century. Tune in daily for an in-depth study of God's Word. Brought to you by Southside Church of Christ.